delegation meeting. It will be a presentation only. Therefore, if you do have questions, please email them to portneverglades at broward.org, and someone from Port Everglades will follow up with you. Also, since this is a conference call, you may want to use your mute button so that we won't be able to hear background noise. And if you do not mute your call, please do not put this call on hold because we will all hear any whole message or music that you might have on your hold key while we are trying to listen to the webinar. So now I would like to introduce Glenn Wilshire, the Deputy Port Director for Port Everglades, who will give us an overview of the U.S. Army Corps' feasibility study and draft environmental impact statement for deepening and widening the port's navigation channel. Glenn, it's all yours. Well, thank you, Lisa, and uh, welcome this afternoon, uh, and senators and representatives and staff. We appreciate you taking the time uh, to get a brief overview of what we see as a critical project for uh, the region. Uh, just the intent is to give you a little bit of background of what we're working on, uh, what is in the draft report that has been issued by the Corps of Engineers, and then to talk about opportunities to engage in the uh, the coming weeks. Uh, first off, I do want to thank you all for all of your support that you've shown uh, th to the port, especially through the, uh, the appropriations process this last year. Uh, a little bit of money was appropriated towards the deepening project. And as you know, uh, the deepening project is just one of three priority projects that the port uh, is focusing on, the other two being the turning notch extension uh, and the uh, rail facility on the port. So uh, we'll go through this presentation. It should be about 30 minutes. Uh, and as Lisa said, if you had any questions, uh, we left an email address uh, that you can email them to us and we'll respond to you in writing. So uh, why is this project necessary? Uh, I think we've talked about this in the past, but here's some recent statistics. Uh, today, uh, post what we call a post-Panamax ship, which is a ship that is wider uh, than what will fit through the Panama Canal, uh, makes up about 16% of the world's fleet, uh, but accounts for almost 45% of the fleet of the capacity throughout the world. And by 2030, uh, although the uh, the percentage is only expected to go up to 27%, it accounts for 62% of the fleet's capacity. So what that means for us here locally is the ships continue to get bigger uh, and we need to grow the port in essence uh, so we can accommodate those bigger ships uh, as they arrive in, uh, in the United States and especially in South Florida. As you can see from the graphic at the bottom, uh, the, the ship that currently calls at the port uh, and fits in cleanly is the fourth generation. Uh, the ship that's called the fifth generation uh, is coming to the port today, uh, but is comes in a lightly loaded condition, which means it is as an efficient as it could be. And then after the proposed deepening is actually in place, uh, the sixth generation, which has a 46 foot uh, plus draft will be able to be accommodated. Uh, it's also needed for safety and operational efficiency. Uh, the picture at the bottom on the left is a tanker that arrived in Port Everglades last week. Uh, that tanker came into port with a 35 foot draft, uh, but it had the capability of being loaded to a 48 foot draft. It actually originated in India with a cargo of jet fuel, but because our channel wasn't deep enough, they actually had to remove some of the cargo in Freeport before they could come into the port. Uh, the other thing is not just the depth of the ship, but the width of the ship. And the other uh, graphic illustrates uh, that as vessels get wider, uh, we have problems with them passing each other in our channels. Uh, the graphic illustrating uh, what we refer to as the South Port Access Channel, which currently, when we have a cruise ship at the dock, uh, at one of our berths there, berth, uh, let's say, 
Cruise Terminal 26, uh, the largest container ships can't transit down to Southport or leave Southport, which means it creates an inefficiency because they have to either stay at anchor or stay at the dock longer than is necessary. A little bit of background about Port Everglades. Uh, uh, Port Everglades actually started as a lake in 1929. It was dredged out, the uh, entrance channel was created, and in 1930 was the first time it was designated as a federal navigation project. In 1935, uh, the entrance channel was deep into 35 feet, and it was made 500 feet wide. Uh, in 1958, the entrance channel was deep into 40 feet, and what we call the turning basin, which is the area right there as you get by the port entrance, was deep into 37 feet. And then finally, in 1974, uh, the entrance channel was deep into its current depth of 45 feet, and the turning basin uh, was deep into 42 feet. Uh, in the 80s, our Southport access channel, which is where all of our container terminals are now in Southport, was actually dredged to the same 42-foot depth. And then uh, towards the end of the 80s and in the early 90s, our turning notch uh, was originally constructed. Uh, 1992 was also the last time uh, under the Federal Water Resources Development Act that uh, uh, the port was authorized to have any deepening. So it's it's we've been around for a long time. So this isn't the first deepening project, uh, probably not the last, uh, but another in a long continuum. Now we've been focusing on the current deepening project for the last 17 years. Uh, as I indicated on the last slide, the last authorization was in 92. But in 96, they started looking at what was needed for the next deepening. Uh, and it's been 17 years since Congress authorized that study to where we are today, where the draft feasibility report uh, and environmental impact statement was released for public comment at the end of June and is out there now for public comment. During that iterative process, uh, there was over 50 meetings and workshops held with stakeholders uh, since 2000, uh, especially with environmental stakeholders. The reason that the Corps does studies like this is it's all about saving transportation costs. So the objectives of the Corps study is to decrease costs associated with delays that might result from congestion. Congestion meaning a ship has to wait out at anchorage uh, until a berth becomes available uh, because of channel passing restrictions like the one I, I uh, just mentioned. If a cruise ship is at the dock, uh, then a cargo ship can't come by uh, if it's a certain size. And uh, also looking at the economies of scale as ships get larger, uh, the amount of petroleum product or containers can be carried on a larger ship so the the unit cost of transportation is lower. They also look at safety and maneuverability. And when they do a study, they're looking out on a 50-year horizon. So 2067 is the 50-year uh, the horizon that they looked at when they did that study. As they looked at that study, they look at the constraints. And as you all know, uh, Port Everglades is smack in the middle of a very sensitive environmental area. Uh, we have mangroves. We have uh, we have coral reefs offshore, we have manatees, we have a number of uh, threatened and endangered species. So they have to take into account all of those environmental factors as they look at uh, the approach. Uh, we also, sitting next to uh, the Fort Lauderdale Hollywood International Airport, have to be concerned about the FAA and the flight surfaces. So that affects the height of the cranes that we can have here at the port and also the size of the ships. And we also have the Coast Guard Station. Uh, and the way the Coast Guard Station is designed, uh, that's part of the project will actually be relocated on their existing property to the east uh, to give more room for a channel. And finally, the approaches to the port are in an area where there's quite a lot of current activity. The current's moving both north and south, which are affect the safety factors. This is the, the port today. Uh, our outer entrance channel is 45 feet. Our inner entrance channel is 42 feet. Uh, and uh, that knuckle, as I referred to, let me see if I can 
figure out how to get a pointer there. That that area where it's constricted, that berth, where if there's a cruise ship sitting there, uh, that cargo ship can't go by. This also highlights some of the environmental habitat uh, that uh, has to be taken into account. The coral reefs offshore, uh, there's actually three reef structures that are offshore. The current channel, which ends right here, uh, affects the inner reef, a part of the middle reef, and then the outer reef uh, is not affected in the current channel. And we'll show uh, what's proposed uh, by the core and the impacts. But we have mangroves, we have seagrass uh, in a number of areas uh, that has to be taken into account. Uh, these mangroves here, uh, you're all familiar with our turning notch extension, uh, which we are proceeding on uh, with quite a bit of state funding uh, to, uh, to uh, expand that and add additional births. So the, all that habitat has to be taken into account as uh, we move forward. So this is what the core has put out for public comment now. You can see in the outer entrance channel goes from 45 feet to 55 feet. Uh, the inner entrance channel as well as this turning basin and the south port access channel uh, goes from its current 42 feet to 48 feet. And this area over here, which is the turning notch, which when the port is, is done with the turning notch extension, the turning notch will actually go back to about here, uh, but the deepening will also go uh, about 900 feet, 1,000 feet into the turning notch itself to accommodate those larger ships will be able to be at the eastern end of that turning notch extension. Now this is sort of a cross section of a channel, just so you have an idea of what, what it looks uh, if you were looking at uh, from a side view. And when the Corps of Engineers actually deepens a channel, uh, they have side slopes. Uh, they'll have what we call the authorized depth, which in this case is 48 feet. And then they'll have uh, what they call an overdredge. In our case, it's uh, a one, one plus one or two feet of overdredge. Uh, those of you uh, probably recall uh, Steve Cernak, uh, when he was visiting Tallahassee, talking about the need for a 50-foot channel. Uh, the core is recommending a 48-foot channel, uh, but with the additional overdredge that will be part of the project, it gets us down to 50 feet, is, which is where we need to be operational. And I'll uh, talk a little bit about that further, but that's, that's basically that's, that's the change, is that uh, originally uh, the core was studying 50 feet, but uh, they uh, recommended depth is 48 feet. Now the economic benefits, which is really what drives how the core decides, uh, you know, what the what the optimal depth is, is based on a a an ec economic model. Uh, as some of you may recall, we were ready to go out with a uh, we thought the core was ready to go out with the draft report last November, and then they found issues with their economic model, so they reran the economic analysis using a uh, nationally certified model called Harbor Sim, uh, and the results of that model showed that the optimal uh, depth, which uh, compares the costs of the project to the benefits that accrue in those savings of transportation costs, uh, was at the 48-foot level with a benefit-to-cost ratio of 1.57 at a discount rate. Now, when the project moves forward, it'll create a little less than 4,800 construction jobs uh, in the Corps of Engineers estimate. So those are the jobs that are associated with the actual uh, construction project, the deepening project itself. When that job is, uh, when the job is complete and we can accommodate those larger vessels here at the port, uh, a port analysis indicates that we'll uh, create almost 1,500 additional permanent direct jobs, direct jobs meaning their jobs here in the local community and in the aggregate between the deepening and our two other projects, our priority projects, uh, will result in a total of 7,000 local jobs as well as supporting an additional 135,000 new jobs statewide. Uh, that is that when the projects and the uh, both the projects are complete as well as the a full capacity on the port side, which is actually out 
uh, in 2027, 10 years after project uh, completion. Now, one of the areas of, of concern is obviously the, uh, the reef because the existing channel does not disturb the, the third reef or the outer reef, uh, but the, to deepen it to 55 feet uh, plus, plus two, which equals 57 feet, uh, will requ require the move, removal of some coral. So the Corps of Engineers identifies uh, their mitigation alternative, and in their report, they looked at a wide range of mitigation alternatives. Uh, the report identifies two specific ones, uh, so we'll talk briefly about them. Uh, what they call the best buy alternative, and what that does is create 12.5 uh, acres of new artificial reef habitat to, re to replace the 10 acres uh, that would be removed. And we have a little, little picture to try to show you what high profile artificial reef means. It basically means it sticks up off the bottom, uh, whether it's boulders uh, or, or anything else uh, that might be placed on the bottom uh, for coral to grow on. Uh, they also create almost seven acres of low profile hard bottom habitat, which basically means it's sitting on a flat bottom out there offshore uh, to replace the five acres that are uh, that are affected or that would be affected. Now there's another alternative that is included in the report uh, that is not the recommended alternative but was identified specifically and that has to do with relocating corals uh, that are in the areas that would be impacting and relocating them to other areas offshore uh, and that is out there for public comment as well. Uh, this whole thing, the whole report is out for public comment and as I say there's other alternatives identified in the report including uh, uh, some ideas on how to address those tires that were placed offshore in the 70s but they're not currently included in the recommended approach uh, that the Corps of Engineers has has included in their report. Uh, in addition to the coral impact there will also be some limited impact on mangroves and on seagrass and uh, as this slide shows, about four acres of seagrass. Now, seagrass is an interesting species because uh, the four acres is what was identified based on the latest core surveys. But the seagrass grows, seagrass go, goes away. So the actual mitigation of seagrass would be dependent and based on studies that are done at the time we get to construction. There will also be a slight loss of, of mangroves uh, in the John U. Lloyd Park area primarily. Uh, and we have uh, the plan includes the port taking mitigation actions uh, for those losses at Westlake Park. I know uh, all of you know where Westlake Park is just south of the port and the types of things that would would be included there uh, is the the addition of a, a protective area for manatees and the uh, development of a a, a crib a riprap for all intents and purposes that would pr provide protection as well as the planting of additional seagrass. So those, those are the types of things that would be done as part of the project in Westlake Park. Now how much does this all cost? Uh, the original estimates that the Corps was looking at when they first had a proposal uh, back in 2000 uh, there was a 320 million dollar cost estimate. Uh, the current estimate based on the proposal that they have out for public comment, $313 million, of which the federal government's cost would be a little over $180 million, and what they refer to as the non-federal share uh, is $130 million. As I indicated, uh, the legislature has already appropriated a little over half a million dollars this, this past uh, legislative session to the port to used towards the uh, engineering and design aspects and we would we would look forward uh, and ask for your support as this project moves forward uh, to be able to get maybe uh, uh, the project is eligible for a 75-25 state uh, local cost share under state law uh, but we're too early in, in the game to uh, look at that it's probably a year or two out. Now this is just shows you how the, the core optimizes 
uh, the cost-benefit analysis and this National Economic Development Plan. And you can see the maximum benefit when they do their analysis and their model, uh, it optimized at 48 feet and with the benefits, annual benefits, just under $9 million. As you go deeper, uh, the, the incremental benefits are reduced as well as the, in, as, and that's primarily because you get a little bit of a benefit because the same ship uh, that can come here uh, with a 50-foot channel can come here at a 48-foot channel based on the, uh, the new Panama Canal uh, dimensions when they open up in 2015. Uh, the benefit-cost ratio, same thing. Uh, you'll see it optimized at 1.57 at that 48-foot uh, depth. And once you go to 50 feet, uh, the benefit-cost ratio goes down. Now, the core does allow a local sponsor, if they want to pay the additional funding uh, to, to pay for that depth, the additional depth. Jacksonville is doing that, for example. Uh, however, uh, that puts the full cost of that additional increment onto the local sponsor. And it also, uh, we then take on full liability for the maintenance costs uh, for any of that additional depth uh, below 48 feet. So we have opted to uh, continue and uh, with the core's recommended uh, plan and depth of the 48 feet. Uh, environmental impacts. We talked about the reefs. We talked about the mangroves. This slide just shows the iterative process that the core has gone through since 2000. Uh, the slide on the left shows uh, in their initial proposal in 2000 how much reef uh, and hard bottom would have been impacted. Uh, it's measured in acres. So in 2000, the Corps' proposal would have impacted over 25 acres of that high, high, high profile or high relief, that's what the HR means, reef and a little less than 15 acres of the lower profile reef. Uh, in the plan that's proposed, they have brought those impacts down to just over 10 acres for the high profile and just over five acres for the low profile. Mangroves, same thing. If you look at the mangrove impacts from 2000, uh, the cumulative effect of mangroves uh, would have been uh, close to 50 acres. And as currently proposed, the uh, uh, the impact of mangroves is a little over an acre. Now, part of that is, as you can see, the red line is the turning notch mangroves, uh, which is about eight acres, uh, which is now a port project and is being done separately by the port. So uh, we're mitigating that, as you are aware. Uh, we're going to be planting here within starting, uh, hopefully soon after the first of the year, planting six and a half acre, 16 and a half acres of new mangroves to replace the 8.7 acres of mangroves that we'll be removing uh, for that turning notch project. So that's why that red line goes from, from eight acres down to zero. But as you can see in the other two proposal, the other two lines, which were the Southport Access Channel and the Dania Cutoff Canal, uh, essentially go to zero. A little bit more il illustrative of what happens, what actually happened uh, in 2000, uh, the plan was to have an outer entrance channel that was a thousand foot wide and also had what's a flare with side slopes. Uh, so what that means, it meant it was, it was a channel, but there was angles coming up uh, and it cut out a lot of uh, coral reef. Uh, the 2013 plan, as proposed, reduces the channel width to 800 feet, uh, reduces the uh, the side slope, and thus takes it from at almost a 40-acre impact down to a little over 15 acres of impact. Uh, and that will be refined as they go through design, uh, but that's a significant reduction uh, from what was proposed originally. Uh, in the Southport Access Channel, uh, when we talked about the mangroves and the significant impact of mangroves almost 50 feet, in 2000, the Corps' plan had uh, a uh, removal of almost 50 acres, and also the potential removal of almost 23% of John U. Lloyd State Park. Obviously, that was really not something that was, was practical. But the big change is, is that by keeping the, the 
the way we're keeping the channel narrower is we're using a different type of bulkhead. Uh, it's called an environmentally friendly bulkhead. We don't have a picture of it up here. But it basically, uh, on the surface, it looks like riprap. You see those rocks, which allows uh, the water to flow through, allows flushing of the, you know, of the mangroves. But when you go below the surface, if you looked at that today, that would actually be a slope. So think of a slope on the side of a hill, and those, those rocks would actually extend all the way down to the bottom. Uh, with an environmentally friendly bulkhead, uh, once you get underwater, you actually have a straight uh, bulkhead uh, made of steel or other material uh, that's invisible. But what that does is allow the channel to be much wider uh, without requiring that additional uh, land. So we think that's a major difference, uh, obviously, uh, going from almost 50 acres of mangrove impact down to uh, a little over one is significant. Uh, some people ask, where does all this material go? Uh, there is an offshore disposal site that's currently designated uh, just north and east of the, of the port. Uh, ODMDS uh, is, is the uh, acronym uh, that is used by the federal government who likes to use acronyms. Uh, and uh, there is a proposal that the, that the actual the uh, U.S. Environmental Protection Agency is currently evaluating expanding uh, that disposal site uh, to accommodate the material that would result from this deepening project as well as from maintenance dredging. Uh, it's estimated between 6 and 7 million cubic yards of material uh, would need to be removed out of the channels, existing channels, and that would be deposited in that offshore disposal facility. ODMDS actually stands for Ocean Dredged Material Disposal Site, uh, but the federal government likes acronyms. Now, important dates coming up. Uh, next Tuesday, the Corps of Engineers is holding two public meetings, uh, one starting at 1 p.m. and the other starting at 7 p.m at the Broward County Convention Center. Uh, at those public meetings, the, the Corps of Engineers will be making a presentation uh, about the project, They're much much longer than what we're doing today, and going into more of the details of the project. And it will also be accepting uh, written public comments for the record. Uh, they also have a public comment period uh, that is open and ends on August 13th. So anyone from the public who has a comment uh, can submit a written comment to the Corps of Engineers. And the Corps of Engineers will take all of those comments into account as they uh, proceed with uh, the completion of the final report. There are also a, a series of meetings on Wednesday, July 24th, that aren't open to the public, uh, but they're focused specifically on meeting with environmental groups uh, that are interested in, in uh, yeah, their uh, focus groups where they can sit down and have a, a dialogue uh, with, uh, with specific environmental groups that have asked uh, to meet uh, separately with the Corps of Engineers to have a dialogue once again, uh, whereas the public meeting is more of a one-way communication from the Corps of Engineers. Uh, those focus groups are more of a dialogue. I should note that at the public meeting, there will actually be the format. Uh, there will be a series of, of four uh, different breakout tables where Corps of Engineers staff uh, that have worked on this project, that are expertise in uh, the engineering uh, part of the project, the economic analysis, and the environmental analysis will be there uh, to have one-on-one uh, -on -one conversations with any member of the public that, that will be there. And hopefully uh, you and your staff will be able to come out to one of those public meetings uh, and listen and hear about this project in more detail. Once the public record is closed, then the Corps of Engineers moves towards completion of the final report. And this shows the timeline. Uh, we have gotten very strong support by our local congressional de delegation. Uh, Congresswoman Wasserman Schultz and Congresswoman Frankel in particular, uh, who have been pressing the Corps of Engineers very hard uh, and on multiple occasions uh, to ensure 
that they can complete the study phase of this project by the end of this year. Uh, so that assumes uh, that the Corps of Engineers will take all the public comments, uh, collect them up, uh, address them, uh, respond to them, and have a final report that will start through the review process in early October. In late October, there will be a meeting in Washington, D.C. Uh, by the Corps of Engineers headquarters staff, which essentially is intended to approve uh, what's in the report with a Chiefs of Engineers report signed by December 2013. That gets the report done. Now, then the next part of it is, what does the U.S. Congress do as it relates to the Water Resources Development Act? Uh, Congress has been working on Water Resources Development Act. Uh, that is a, a bill that is required uh, for a project to be authorized, uh, to be funded by the federal government. The last Water Resources Development Act was in 2007. Uh, the Senate has already passed their very version of WERDA, as it's called. Uh, the House will be taking up WERDA probably in September. Uh, from our perspective, we are trying to do everything we can do to ensure that our project is included and authorized in that bill, whether either directly uh, or through what we refer to as a contingent authorization, uh, which has been done in past WERDAs, uh, to allow projects that the final report is not yet completed uh, to be uh, authorized once the project is completed by the Corps of Engineers. If everything stays on track, uh, by next February, they'll start design of the, of the uh, project with construction starting in 2016 and construction being completed by 2017. Now, if you look at the Corps of Engineers report, you'll, you might see that they actually have a timeline that's a little longer uh, because they have laid out a timeline that is based on consecutive uh, construction. So they start with the outer entrance channel, to the inner entrance channel, and they do it consecutively. Uh, what we have uh, recommended to them and they have agreed to in concept is a concurrent construction project, which means uh, they're working on all of the segments of the port at the same time. With that, it is uh, feasible to have the project completed by December of 2017. The full report has been posted on the Army Corps of Engineers website uh, and is easy to find. Uh, and you can just, uh, the report, uh, the, it's about a foot of paper, uh, at least. Uh, and I'm looking at one across the room here. There's three, three binders that are very large binders. Uh, it's not something you want to you know, take home and read in one night. Uh, but it is, the report has a lot of background of, of why the Corps ended up where they got to. Uh, and there is a project manager uh, where comments are being submitted to in writing, uh, by email, by letter, as the case may be. Uh, so with that, that's the end of our, our presentation. Uh, once again, thank you for your support. Uh, if you have any comments or questions, uh, you can email them to us at porteverglades at broward.org. Uh, so that email address again, porteverglades at broward.org. And if you email us any questions, we'll be happy to send you a, a written response. Uh, hope to see some of you at the uh, Corps of Engineers public meeting uh, next Tuesday. And finally, on behalf of Steve Sarnak, who couldn't join us here for this webinar, Thank you for all the support you've provided to the port, uh, not just on this project, but all of the projects, because you do realize how much of an economic engine that the port is. And I know uh, I look forward to your continued support as we uh, go through the next few months with the Corps of Engineers. Uh, Lisa, that's the end of it. If you have any, do you have any closing comments? Okay, yes, we will do that. We actually, we, we have a copy of the PowerPoint, 
and we have actually recorded it so there'll there is a a file that someone will be able to get that actually has the the audio as well as the PowerPoint in synchronization so uh, we'll be happy to provide that to you Okay. Well, thank you once again, and have a great day. We're signing off. That's here.